YouTube fam, it's your boy, Jeff Rosado, and I am finally back from vacation. <laughs> Which means that I'm ready to provide you guys some more sorcery content. So I have my Mortals Tribe deck list here. I made a poll in the Facebook community group and everyone voted to see which deck techs they wanted to see featured on my channel. And this deck tied with my Seer deck list. If you haven't seen that already, definitely check that out. Uh, this is my most recent video that I uploaded. And yeah, Mortals and Seer tied. So it's finally time that I go over this awesome deck tech with everyone. So for starters, let's just go right on into the avatar. We have Sorcerer. I mean, everyone kind of knows what Sorcerer does. He's kind of the icon of Sorcery. <laughs> uh, this card is, like, I mean, honestly, there's other avatars you can play, but I felt like Sorcerer was just right for this list. Now, I was experimenting with four elements with this deck, and I found out that two was just the right call. So getting on to our artifacts, we play the one Philosopher's Stone, one Amethyst Core, and one Onyx Core. If you want to have a good accelerant game plan in the early game, these are definitely going to be staples for what you're trying to go for. And we also have two Mix Air and two Mix Terra. I normally don't experiment with mixes. They're kind of a hit or miss for me. You know, if you're playing multiple elements, they're going to be trickier to, you know, make them work. But for just a two element base deck like this, I felt like they actually held their own weight and they were able to actually accelerate into our mid game plan. Fun fact, I actually found an interesting combo with these two. And I'll definitely go on to that combo later on in the video. So just stay tuned towards the end of that. Going into our last artifact, we are playing the Immortal Throne. Just basically being a draw engine for us and a alternate win condition. We are a mid-range based deck here, so our game plan is just to play minions, attack as often as possible. And if we have the Immortal Throne, we want to try and capitalize on it as best as we can. Everyone knows what the Immortal Throne does. If you don't, well, that's kind of unfortunate because I have it posted all over my YouTube, so... Definitely check out my content if you haven't seen any previous videos, and it'll explain it more in depth. So going into our minions, I play the one Highland Princess. Highland Princess is just really good. Uh, being a mortal and a princess, she also allows us to fetch out our early game mana rocks, and that's really good. I mean, we essentially want to see these almost always, so having a card that can search for them is just vital. And yeah, I was trying to aim for a royalty-esque type of theme here, so she fits perfectly into the theme. For our three drops, we're playing Apprentice Wizard. Uh, everyone knows what Apprentice Wizard does. It essentially just draws you a card, and with the Immortal Throne, if you have this on three counters, you can essentially draw two cards when you play it, which is just really good. Now, this deck doesn't really have that low of a curve for minions so it has to rely on these artifacts or early game spells that kind of get us through the early game but once you're past the early game and you have a good amount of board presence you should be in a good seat so next we have three phase assassin phase assassin is just a really good card i mean having void walk and just being able to summon it near your opponent's avatar as long as they have a void square of course but also getting over the fact that they can't target it because it gains stealth is really good. This card is also a part of the combo that I'll explain later. Yeah, I know. It, it's it's pretty interesting. For our other 3-drop, we have the Crown Prince. Again, going for the royalty theme here. If it dies, and if you happen to control another mortal, you can actually return the Crown Prince back to the owner's hand. We have three Skirmishers of Mu. So this card is actually... Just really good. It's actually insanely good. So it has ranged. And during basic movement, Skirmishers of Mu may perform a ranged strike from any location among their path. So what this in basically means is 
if you're using the basic move and attack ability, when you declare the attack, you can also perform a range strike. It essentially allows you to attack twice. This is really good. I mean, with three power, being able to dish out a potential six damage is just really strong. But also, this card has some neat interactions with intercepting and defending. So, for example, right? If you're using a minion to enter your opponent's site, and if they have a minion there, they can just intercept it. So, ideally, when you move, you can declare the range strike, but if they intercept it, then, I mean, it's kind of bad for you. The same could be said if you declare an attack, because then your opponent can also block it while you're using a basic movement. But what really makes this card insane is if you manage to just move on your side, as long as your opponent can't intercept it, and since you're just moving it, your opponent cannot block. So then that means that just simply moving, you're able to get the range strike off. And you can also kind of prevent this from being involved in combat. And that's crazy. That's actually just really insane. We have two Royal Bodyguard. Royal Bodyguard is just kind of in here as a defensive card. If a nearby avatar or royalty were to take damage, the bodyguard would just take damage instead. So royalties mean king, queen, prince, and princess. And yeah, I, I think that this card is pretty decent. Um, the fact that he's immortal and protects your royalties is just really good. Going into more royalties here, we have Queen of Midland. I, I wouldn't say that this is like... A great card but it can certainly have potential if you know how to play it right uh, for starters it is five mana so it does help with our curve with the immortal throne and honestly with the immortal throne i think is the best way to play this card see because okay hear me out when you have the immortal throne your goal is to try and accelerate as many counters as you can on it first because more than likely your opponent has built a deck with a low curve and because I mean that's that's typically what you see in TCGs. Most people just want to play aggro and they want to play cards that can just accelerate their game plan, so they'll play a lower curve. And if you were to generate the counters on the Immortal Throne, you'll gain the benefit, and it may be harder for your opponent to actually get the later counters on. But let's say, for example, the Immortal Throne doesn't have that many counters on it, but you have the Queen of Midland. Now check this out. After an opponent draws a card. If they have more cards than you, then you draw a card. So, sometimes your opponent will just forget the Immortal Throne will trigger when they cast cards. So then they'll draw a card. And if they have more cards than you, you're just going to draw. Which is pretty sweet. I and mean, essentially, that's really the best case scenario with this card. Um, it only has one power and toughness, so it is fairly easy to kill. But with a Royal Bodyguard, you can essentially protect the Queen from taking damage... And if you play her at a good time, you're just going to gain more card advantage and just kind of pace out with your opponent. You never really have to worry about them having too many cards. Speaking of card advantage, we play a two Grandmaster Wizard. I mean, this card is just, I mean, self-explanatory. It comes in play, draws three cards, and it has Spellcaster, which is great. For our sevens, I have the one Highland Clansman. Highland Clansman is essentially in here with charge to dish out five damage. And with Mixed Terra, you can essentially get it out fairly quick. Our last seven is probably the most important mortal in the entire game, and it is King of the Realm. When this guy comes in play, you just control all mortals, and he gives all other mortals plus one power. It's a really strong card. I mean, he is the King of the Realm, right? In a way, you really want to just save these cards to win with the Immortal Throne. But it doesn't hurt to just race these cards out to try and aggro the game and finish off your opponent as quickly as you can. And that's exactly what King of the Realm is going to do. And if your opponent just happens to have mortals, great. You just gain control of all of them. Getting on into our spells, I have one Dream Quest and one Browse. I almost didn't put Dream Quest in this deck, but with the Immortal Throne, you kind of want to play it because this is just a way of how to search this out. And, I mean, again, with all these spellcasters, it's just really great to just search your deck for any card that you need at a given moment. And, of course, Browse, uh, also just giving you more consistency. Looking at your next seven cards, selecting one of them to go to your hand, and then you can rearrange the rest of the cards on the bottom of your library. 
and you can just rearrange the rest of the cards uh, on the bottom of your spell book in any order. So yeah, just just consistency in the form of these cards is really great. And the fact that they're one cost also just helps set up the throne's counters. We have four Lightning Bolt. If we're not playing that many low curve minions, this is just kind of great to dish, just dish out any early game minions your opponent may have and just kind of tempo the deck as best as you can. Three Call to War. Uh, essentially, this card is just common sense, but it lets you search your deck for any exceptional mortal, and then you put it in your hand. I wish that this was at 4, because this card is actually really good. To be honest, though, you only have two targets. You have the Skirmishers of Mu and the Phase Assassin, but those are the minions you want to like search out for anyways, because Phase Assassin is just going to aggro your opponent, and then Skirmishers of Mu is just going to provide an insane amount of board presence that'll just kind of force your opponent to just play around it. So Call of War is just really good for just searching those out. So we have two Chaos Twister. I felt like I needed to play this just for the sheer fact that it is air and being the fact that it's a four removal spell that can also uh, pressure the game and force your opponent to take damage is just really, I mean, this card is just actually just bonkers insane. Like if you're playing air you really want to just try to play this. And if you're scared of the mechanic, like, I get it. It's definitely tricky to land, but when you practice it, and if you actually check out my Chaos Twister video, you'll kind of learn tricks on how to actually perform this action and always land your Chaos Twister. So yeah, you just need to play two of these. It's just so broken. Another really powerful spell, we have two Earthquake. I had to show some love to this card. Like, I don't really play it that much, but it is a, a very strong card and you have to respect that your opponent may have this see because you can rearrange sites within a two by two area you're carrying along everything of normal size and then you burrow all minions and artifacts on those sites so this is just good to rearrange your sites close to your opponents and also if the minions that are on top of those sites so you can just basically burrow them so it can be a removal spell it could just be a board sweep and it also manipulates the sites on the board which is just actually just broken it's really good actually all right getting on into the atlas we have the one color out of space now i feel like this card is just a staple right sure we're playing a two element style deck but this card actually has it has an interesting interaction that a lot of people aren't aware of and actually as a matter of fact there's some that i do need to go over so a lot of people have been wondering why I don't play Undertaker Engine in the Immortal Throne list, and there's several reasons why. So for starters, I think that Undertaker Engine is more of a sideboard card, and it really is not that great if you're going up against a water deck, right? And even if the fact that you're going up against a Earth-style deck that plays Cave-In or Barry, that's why the color out of space is just really insane. See, because if you play it underneath your avatar at the beginning of the game, and if you have the Immortal Throne here, but your opponent's trying to cave it in or they're trying to use Barry, they can't. And the reason why is because the color out of space is a water sight. And that's something that a lot of people just kind of misunderstand about this card. Sure, it provides one of each threshold, but the fact that it's a water sight means that it gives you some flexibility against certain decks. If you're going up against a you know, Wave Shaper, or if you're going up against a deck that you suspect is a water element deck, then you can use Sorcerer to actually just play a land site, and you can be safe with the Immortal Throne, because you don't have to worry about them using Stormy Seas or Drown to drown this. And, you know, that's why I feel like the color out of space is just really good, because, logically speaking, right, everyone is only able to play four elements, but only one of those elements is water. So that means that the other three elements make it easier for you to play cave in, for you to play berry, because those three uh, elements only provide land sites. Why water has such a huge advantage is because it's really just the only site that you have that makes it easier for drown or stormy seas to work. But again, if your opponent is only just playing Barry or Caven, 
And if you have this with the Immortal Throne, they can never bury it. And that's something that's just really good. Uh, of course, there's cards that can, like Drought, for example, that can turn this into a land site. But that's why the color out of space is just insane. And that's why a lot of people just overlook it. So that's why it made the cut in here. Because I didn't want just only land sites. I did want a water site in some way, shape, or form. Just so I can get around my opponent submerging or burrowing, burrowing the Immortal Throne. And that's why I don't really play the Undertaker engine. Because... If you can just play around what your opponent is playing, you never have to worry about the Immortal Throne being submerged or burrowed. And actually, even if they do successfully do that, the Immortal Throne will still activate its trigger abilities, even underground. Sure, you can't win the game with it unless your avatar is underground as well, but you can still draw cards from it. And that's why the Immortal Throne is just so good. And it's the only main reason why you want to play the Immortal Throne is just for the card advantage. We have Pillar of Xeros. Pillar of Xeros has just been pulling its own weight. Uh, just being able to banish all dead minions and gain one life. Uh, this card can really put you back in the game in late game if there's tons of minions that are in the cemetery. We have one Kingdom of Agartha. Uh, I mean, it's really only in here just because we are playing Earth Threshold and having some sort of way to burrow minions is good against cards like Root Spider. Of course, your opponent can take advantage over this card, but again, it's really just only in there just to kind of counteract Root Spider in some way, shape, or form. The best thing that I would say to do is if you have Kingdom of Agartha active when you, your opponent has Root Spider, you can summon an Apprentice Wizard underground and then use Lightning Bolt. It's so satisfying. We play one Boneyard. If you're playing Immortal Throne, I feel like you just have to play this because, again, this will just resurrect a minion from the cemetery and it could potentially trigger the Immortal Throne as well. So just, you know, neat little interactions with that card. And, of course, just being able to bring back any dead minions that we need, like a King of the Realm or a Skirmishers of Mu. Uh, the card can just really get out of hand. Play the one Geistwood. Ideally, this is just only in here for the Wizards and the Highland Princess. Um, but other than that, you're not really going to gain much benefit from this. Play the one Mirror Realm. Gotta play Mirror Realm. It just copies any site, any good site that's in play. Copy yours, copy your opponents. It's just so good. We're also playing Roots of Yagdrissel. I've just been falling in love with this card. Um, you know, a lot of people have been telling me that it's almost impossible to get this off every game. Like, more than likely, you're not going to get it off every game, sure. But you have to remember, you're playing a 20-card Atlas, and it's easier to draw into your cards compared to a 40-card Spellbook. And why Avatars are so good is because every Avatar has the ability to draw a Sight. It, sure, it's probably not the best ability, but... Being able to dig through your atlas can be beneficial because if you're trying to get something like this early game, you can completely just board sweep, reset the game, and if you're lucky enough to have more cards than your opponent, you can basically just outvalue them if you know what you're doing. So we play two sinkhole. Uh, this is essentially your best way to destroy the roots of Yagdrissel and then just, you know, reset the board. But Sinkhole is just obviously really broken because you can spend the mana when you play it and you can use it to destroy your opponent's sights and that just kind of puts them behind. Like, if you're able to play an Apprentice Wizard, draw a card, use Sinkhole to blow up their sight, you're, you're gaining, like, so much value. You're gaining board presence, you're putting them back on mana, and at the same time, you drew a spell with the Apprentice Wizard. That's, that's just so much value. Like, this card is actually broken. This is the best card in sorcery. Like, I keep trying to tell people, you gotta play this card. We play two Observatory. This is just really so we can fixate the top cards of our deck. And then using Sorcerer to kind of just draw into them is also really good. But sometimes you just need to rearrange the top cards of your deck and then just go from there. Now, you could play Cloud City. And Cloud City has been a hit or miss for me. But you can definitely play Cloud City in this list to fulfill your mana and your threshold needs, and also just have some interaction with it as well. But yeah, I just wanted to go with the two observatory for just um, draw control. Play three windmill, uh, just being your dual site 
for the deck and for your thresholds. I mean, it, it's enough said. And then we play three of the towers, just being able to accelerate our game plan and get us extra mana. And this one's questionable. Like, I mean, honestly, you guys don't really have to play these, but I play one of each of the villages. This is just something where I can gain some early board presence and also at the same time uh, just kind of aggro my opponent in certain situations. You could play Holy Ground, and honestly, I was originally playing Holy Ground, but the reason why I took them out for the villages is, of course, for the board presence, but I didn't like how if I drew Holy Ground, I would have to keep it in my hand until I was low on life, and sometimes, of course, you're just going to need it right off the bat to gain life, but you can't exceed your normal life total, so every avatar's life total currently is just 20, and you can't exceed that. So if you're at 20 life, the Holy Ground's just, you know, you're either going to play it and then just not activate it and lose the trigger to gain life. Um, but I really like the villages because I can play them early. I don't have to really worry about when's a good time to play them. They're just always going to be active, especially when I can make tokens out of them. Okay, guys. So now I'm going to go ahead and showcase my combo. And ideally, this is just the setup that you want. You just want three sites in play. And preferably a core. Uh, if you were to get a core out, you can just perform this essentially close to your fourth turn. And you will need these five cards in your hand. I know that's oddly specific. I was able to pull this off twice. It's not very likely that you'll always have this live. But just the sheer potential of it is just insane. So, you have four mana. You go ahead and spend the four mana to cast the Immortal Throne. And then using our avatar, we will tap them to play a site. And the site that we're going to play here is Gothic Tower. Or just any tower, honestly. As long as you're just going to generate the two mana. Now, this is a card that costs zero mana. And we are playing it with the Immortal Throne in play. So the Immortal Throne will trigger. It will get its first counter. And we will draw a card. You can choose to draw a site if you want, it really doesn't matter, but for this sake I'm just going to do spells. So now with the two mana that you have, you're going to spend one of them to cast a Mixed Terra. Mixed Terra's original printed cost is one, so it will trigger the Immortal Throne and you will draw another card. Now you will sacrifice the Mixed Terra, you will get three mana and your next Earth spell doesn't have to play its threshold cost. So the next spell we'll play will be Call to War. Now, Call to War will trigger the Immortal Throne since it's two, and we will draw another card. With Call to War, we will search our deck here for a Phase Assassin. So now, with the one mana you have left from the Gothic Tower, you will cast a Mix Air. This will not trigger Throne, but that's alright. We will use it so that our next Air spell costs 3 less mana and doesn't require any threshold requirements. So now we get to play this Phase Assassin for free. We'll play it as close to our opponent's avatar as possible in the Void. And since we're casting the Phase Assassin, we will trigger the Immortal Throne once again so this neat little combo isn't like groundbreaking or anything but it is certainly just really good for the sheer fact that we were able to draw four cards get four counters on the immortal throne and place a decent board presence on our opponent now it is going to be a little bit tougher for them to gain value from the immortal throne because like i said before most decks have a low curve and it's going to be tougher for them to play spells that cost 4 mana or 5. It's not entirely impossible, but this just essentially makes it so you've gained half of the counters that you need on the Immortal Throne to get its win condition, and you were able to gain a decent amount of card advantage. And yeah, just off of that, uh, it's a neat little combo play, and I would have never thought that the mixes would have helped with the Immortal Throne. So it, it is nice to see how they kind of help with this little combo. 
there you have it guys this is my mortals tribe deck tech i hope that you guys have enjoyed it i really love this deck archetype now i'm not saying that it is highly competitive or it's the best deck ever but it does have neat interactions and it has really awesome card choices and yeah i just hope that you guys really enjoyed this if you guys want to see more deck techs or want to recommend more deck techs, feel free to send me a message, comment on my YouTube, reach out to me, and I'll do my best to provide more content for you guys. Stay tuned because I have a lot more planned now that I have a little bit more time on my hands. And yeah, as always guys, like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I hope you guys have an awesome week.